For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus. Well, good afternoon. So I was having a casual conversation with a friend of mine last night talking about some of the work we're doing on rental protection here in the state of California. I started talking about what BCSH would be doing, how that related to the CDC's new guidelines a week after Fannie and Freddie uh, and the folks at HUD had put out some new guidelines. And I realized quickly that I was not only confusing him, uh, I was confusing myself. Uh, this whole area of rental protections, the issues of evictions, uh, can make your head spin, particularly if you're just someone uh, that simply wants to know what the heck is going on and how can I avoid uh, being evicted from my home because of the impact that COVID-19 has had on my job and my capacity to actually make ends meet. And so in an effort to try to make sense of all of that, I'm going to try to make sense uh, of what the state of California is doing in relationship to what housing and urban development has done in relationship to what the CDC uh, has done with regard to some national guidelines uh, on evictions and foreclosures, uh, but really lay out uh, the strategy for this state pursuant to a bill I signed close to midnight uh, 48 hours ago uh, that we believe will protect millions and millions of renters here in the state of California. Uh, we actually have a website as well that we hope can clarify uh, and allow for the ability for you and your family uh, to try to navigate some of the most frequently asked questions uh, and access resources uh, so that you can get uh, a real uh, concrete response during this very anxious time. But I want to lead with this. California is very proud of its leadership leading the nation in renter protection. You may recall last year, a, a bill 1482, uh, we've set forth the strongest eviction protections uh, in the United States of America. A statewide rent cap was put into place. We were able to work with the legislature, work with some settlement dollars that came from an old mortgage settlement uh, that the state had to loosen up the availability of $351 million for counseling services, uh, direct uh, grants, aid to tenants as well uh, as homeowners, which is important part uh, of this conversation. Clearly, COVID has had a profound impact. Uh, and despite having some of the strongest renter protections in the nation, uh, that has not ameliorated the stress, the anxiety uh, that millions and millions of renters and homeowners are facing, struggling clearly uh, with this pandemic. And so we've been working very closely uh, with the legislature over the course of the last number of months. We had put together a number of stopgap uh, efforts around executive orders and what we refer to in the state as the Judicial Council did the same, uh, but those all expired. And so we needed to work in a more inspired way uh, to come together uh, as legislature, the governor, uh, with advocates representing uh, every perspective of this debate. Uh, and we moved forward uh, with new legislation that fundamentally addresses what you see on this page, and that is uh, the impact uh, this virus has had on millions of you. Four, or rather 5.4 million renters uh, at risk now uh, of uh, being, you know, losing their, losing their homes. Uh, small property owners being foreclosed on because they can't make mortgage payments because renters uh, can't make the monthly payments. And you can see just from this chart, the impact uh, is disproportionate on our diverse communities, uh, the African-American, Latino community in particular in the state of California, vulnerable, millions vulnerable uh, to being evicted, thrown out onto the streets. Uh, the Turner Institute came up with a survey that estimated just in the state of California that renters specifically as a class in this state uh, have experienced anywhere from a 50 to 66% drop in their income uh, since this pandemic, uh, uh, well, since this pandemic. 
And that is profound and clearly impactful. And so this legislation uh, was foundational uh, in terms to try to stabilize for the moment uh, that reality for millions and millions of Californians. Uh, what we have is new eviction protections uh, where individual tenant uh, fills out a declaration uh, a hardship declaration related to the impact of COVID-19 specifically uh, on their ability to make uh, monthly rental payments. We've extended our protections uh, through February 1st of next year. So no evictions for rent non-payment related to COVID-19 uh, through February 2021. There are provisions in the bill, provisions that we've advanced uh, where people that can we would like to see them make uh, partial rent payments over the next number of months, roughly 25% at least, and that's a minimum, uh, rental payments uh, to help support uh, this collective effort. Again, we're not only supporting renters, uh, we wanna be very sensitive to the needs, particularly of small property owners. Uh, people with just a few units, people uh, that literally maybe inherited property or uh, you know, saved money, uh, put everything on the line to buy a few rental units, uh, and they have a mortgage that they took out, uh, and they rely on you uh, as a tenant to make those payments in order to make their payments. Uh, and so all of this had to be considered, and all of this was as it relates to new foreclosure protections that we put into this bill to expand homeowner bill of rights for units, one to four uh, units, as well as to expand borrower rights as it relates to forbearance. Uh, this long way of saying this is all in relationship to how the banks interact with small property owners and putting some light, uh, putting some protections in place in that area as well. An effort, as I said, to make you know some understanding of all of this. Um, the state of California has put together a new website, and I'm going to ask in a moment that the head of uh, B, uh, BSCH, uh, which is our business consumer services housing, basically our housing agency for the purposes of this presentation, uh, Lourdes will come up and she will talk about uh, her work uh, in putting together this site, housingiskey.com. Housing is key. Dot com. That's the new site. If you can't write that down or don't remember it, but you remember the covid19.ca.gov website, the main website, the main platform, uh, we have this information on that site, covid19.ca.gov. But this new housing is key site is a website that will provide guidance, more importantly, resources, again, not just for tenants, uh, but landlords, homeowners, and the like. Talk about the details of our new eviction framework, what the protections are, what they're not, uh, and try to help explain uh, all of this in a way that not only you can understand, but your lawyer uh, can understand as well. Toolkits, legal aid resources, as you see, uh, and uh, a FAQ section, frequently asked questions section. Uh, here's a static picture of that homepage uh, of housing is key, uh, and it is now uh, appropriate at this moment that I now turn over uh, this presentation to Lourdes Castro Ramirez, who has worked so hard uh, in her capacity as chair of this agency to make sure uh, that this site is dynamic, up and running, uh, and means something. And I say means something to everybody, every Californian. You'll see the reverence to California for all, uh, always mindful. Uh, that California is the most diverse state in the world's most diverse democracy. And we recognize we speak many languages. Sometimes we speak past each other. We don't want to do either. We want to make sure that we meet people where they are. And Lourdes is here uh, to do just that as she explains the site a little bit more, uh, but also provides uh, some remarks in Spanish as well. Thank you so much, uh, Governor Newsom. Uh, much, muchísimas gracias. Um, as uh, the governor mentioned, I'm uh, Lourdes Castro Ramirez, and I serve as the secretary of California's Business, Consumer Services, and Housing Agency. And um, just want to acknowledge the leadership of our governor. Um, I definitely agree with him uh, when he says that it's very important that we make sense of our housing system. Um, I think we're firm believers that we um, 
need to do much more to coordinate and ensure that we have a housing system that provides housing services from homelessness to home ownership. Uh, and so, as, as we all know, there, during this pandemic, uh, many tenants have struggled to pay the rent and may be uh, just one paycheck away from losing their apartment or the place that they call home. Thanks to the new law that has been signed by the governor just on Monday, uh, and of course, um, with the leadership of the legislature, no renter can be evicted from their home if they're experiencing financial hardship due to COVID-19. And today, as the governor mentioned, we are excited um, to be able to launch uh, this one dedicated site to help educate and provide the resources that tenants, landlords, homeowners, and also our partner agencies will need to help navigate through these protections to ensure that nobody um, loses their place that they call home. The Housing is Key campaign will provide Californians uh, with information in multiple languages uh, with resources as um, outlined. And so we invite you to visit uh, the covid19.ca.gov or uh, housingiskey.com. And now I'd like to uh, pivot and uh, share some remarks in Spanish for our Spanish speaking uh, uh, audience and community members. Buenas tardes, uh, soy Lourdes Castro Ramírez, uh, secretaria del de Departamento de la Agencia uh, de uh, Vivienda, Servicios al Consumidor y Negocios. Uh, y durante esta pandemia todos sabemos que muchos inquilinos han tenido dificultades para pagar el alquiler o la renta. Y es posible que estén a un cheque de perder su apartamento o su casa. Gracias a una nueva ley, firmada por el gobernador con el apoyo de la, de la legislatura, uh, el gobernador uh, Gavin Newsom este lunes uh, firmó una ley uh, donde ningún inquilino puede ser desalojado de su casa si está pasando por dificultades, especialmente dificultades aso asociadas con COVID-19. Hasta, uh, las protec protecciones van a estar disponibles hasta el 31 de enero del 2021. Hoy nos complace también en anunciar una nueva campaña, la campaña llamada La Vivienda es Clave, Housing is Key. Otra vez, La Vivienda es Clave. Los californianos uh, pueden visitar COVID-19 o La Vivienda es Clave para tener acceso a los recursos necesarios uh, para mantenerse informados y también para tener acceso a estas protecciones. Esta campaña uh, permanecerá uh, vigente no nomás durante el COVID-19, pero uh, el plan es de seguir uh, dando recursos a la comunidad. También hay información para los propietarios de viviendas para ayudarles a cómo navegar los recursos. Y el sitio tiene formularios, tiene formas para ayudarles uh, con este proceso. Están disponibles en español y en otros idiomas. Estamos comprometidos a brindar la mayor cantidad de información y los recursos necesarios para que todos los californianos puedan tener acceso a una vivienda digna. Muchas gracias por su apoyo y por estar con nosotros durante estos uh, momentos tan difíciles. Con eso, invito al gobernador para que siga su uh, presa. Thank you, Lourdes. And, uh, and so that's the site, and we hope people take advantage of it, avail themselves of it, and uh, in an effort to uh, avail you of a little bit of deeper insight into understanding of what occurred over the last uh, 24 hours. You may have read that the federal government came out with some new federal guidelines through the CDC uh, that put forth some tenant protections that last uh, through the end of this year. 
Uh, our protections are not impacted by those federal rules and regulations. Uh, our protections go a little farther than the federal government. There's no income cap as the federal government currently has. Again, ours go through February 1st of next year. They don't expire at the end of this year. Uh, the reference to Fannie and Freddie uh, and housing and urban development, uh, all of those, again, separate tracks, uh, part and parcel uh, of the well, the broad swatch of uh, our landlord and mortgage back assistance and other uh, federal agencies that are in this tenant and landlord space. Again, not to confuse you, uh, we're just trying to, again, find our own place in this map, in this mix. Uh, and California, again, is leaning in uh, more aggressively than we believe any other state in this country and this resource guide, this website, hopefully will clarify any specific questions you have. And one of those questions, by the way, that you may have is, uh, I live in a community, uh, they actually go even further. Uh, all local ordinances, all local rules and regulations are not impacted uh, by the federal uh, guidelines that just came out, nor what the state of California is doing. So, uh, got to weave through a little bit all of this. We're hoping to make it a little bit easier on this housing is key website, and we encourage you to avail yourself to it. Uh, and I just want to thank um, all of the good work that was done by the California legislature and legislative leadership, uh, a lot of key staff. Uh, that worked uh, very aggressively and diligently to uh, get that bill done uh, and to quite literally get it uh, signed before midnight deadline, which we were able to accomplish uh, late Monday evening. Uh, what Lourdes just referenced, though, was not just the issues of housing. Uh, she also referenced the issue of homelessness. Uh, it goes without saying these things are connected, putting millions and millions of Californians uh, at risk uh, of being removed from their homes, uh, from their apartments, uh, would obviously impact uh, our greater call in terms of addressing and ending homelessness here in the state of California. This remains the top priority of our administration. As we battle COVID, we have not taken our eye off the ball in terms of our responsibility to address the issue of homelessness. Uh, we came in. Uh, to the year, with this being our top priority. We're going to continue to focus on this through the end of this year, and I can assure you uh, for many, many years to come as we must do more and do better in this space. Uh, and so I wanted to give people just an update, brief update, uh, in some of those, uh, as it relates to some of those efforts. Last year, you may have seen, and we talked a lot about it, we put an unprecedented amount of support uh, to address the issue of homelessness, supporting cities and counties uh, with discretionary money, the likes of which they have never had in the past. Uh, close to a billion dollars direct supports for homelessness. And that's not our entire housing portfolio. That's just specifically targeting the issue of homelessness. It's not just about spending money. I recognize that. It's a resourceful mindset. Doing things differently is also foundational in our approach, and that is deeply part of our focus as we moved into this new year. Uh, we did $628 million in this last budget, despite historic budget shortfalls. Uh, we put an additional $628 million in emergency aid to help support cities and counties uh, under the pressure uh, of COVID-19 and the economic outcomes as a consequence. Uh, we also uh, announced efforts this year uh, to put $600 million into a new initiative, uh, Project Home Key. Uh, I've talked about it in the past. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment, but all total. $1.25 billion was put into this year's budget uh, more than last year, despite the budgetary challenges, more than last year to focus on an emergency approach, a direct service approach uh, to create, as we say in psychology, a pattern interrupt uh, to what we see out on the streets and sidewalks. And I am not naive because I see exactly what you see. Uh, and I can assure you, uh, we are just uh, winding up in many of these efforts. Uh, Project Home Key comes from a program many of you are familiar with, uh, which is our Room Key program. Just since April, and I think this is an important slide, just since April, we took pen to paper, came up with an idea, and looked at this COVID crisis anew as it relates to the issue of homelessness. And we have provided housing for 22,000 people just in the last few months. 
years and years to build up a system. Uh, and overnight, just in the last 100 plus days, we are able to serve over 22,000 individuals. We are able to procure over 16,000 hotel rooms, 344 different hotels, and 55 of our 58 counties, including uh, tribal, uh, sovereign tribal nations that participated uh, in this unprecedented effort, this uh, unprecedented program. Uh, we want to build on that program as we built uh, last year an additional uh, point of access, and that was 1,345 uh, new trailers that we were able to get out uh, to 26 counties and two tribal nations. By the way, 1,345 trailers. Um, these trailers went out, were delivered, uh, and these trailers are not just for one individual. Many uh, families are in these trailers. Many individuals have cohorted in these trailers. Uh, it's been, again, part and parcel of our emergency response to deal with this crisis, all part, again, of uh, the Project Room Key effort. But as I said, this Room Key effort now is merging uh, into a Home Key strategy, more permanence. That was an emergency response, now we need a permanent response. And I've long believed uh, that homelessness is solved through permanent supportive housing. I said it many, many times uh, that shelter solves sleep, but housing and supportive services solve homelessness. I've had a bias for decades, housing first. Housing as a point of stability, point of pride, a key, a lock, place to call your home, then you start dealing with the underlying issues, the reason people are out in the streets and sidewalks in the first place. But stability is foundational. You live out on the elements, you live under a freeway overpass, and someone says, well, maybe you shouldn't self-medicate any longer. That's harder to convince an individual than when they have a place to call their home, a place where they feel safe, where they can actually put their belongings, where they can take a deep breath, and they can start contextualizing the conditions that led uh, to their situation in the first place. And so that's why we have put tremendous effort uh, and very gratified that this effort was supported by the legislature, uh, supported by many in the advocacy community and many cities and counties, which I'll get to in a moment. 600, unprecedented, $600 million program to purchase permanent hotels and motels and apartment buildings throughout the state of California so we can convert to being part of our permanent stock of support. Uh, not all permanent supportive housing, many transitional housing, uh, many of these units could be used for a myriad of purposes, but provide us assets the state has never had in the past. And let me just make this crystal clear. As a former mayor, the state hasn't been focused on the issue of homelessness. It hasn't been a focus uh, of many, many administrations. It's not a point of critique. Uh, it's just factual. It has been focus of mayors primarily and county officials uh, that have, well, have been burdened with this challenge. And we're trying to change that paradigm, build capacity, build partnership, recognizing that it is localism that's determinative, meaning local government has to drive, uh, actually, actually deliver, uh, but the state is now providing more in the ways of support than we ever have. Again, we're just getting started. I recognize the conditions all throughout the state of California. They're unacceptable, and we're going to have to significantly do more, and particularly into the next year as we work our way out of COVID and deal with the economic uh, uh, ch challenges. It's self-evident that this has to be our top priority, and it is. So $600 million was set aside in the budget to purchase these hotels and motels. Here's the good news. 138 applications have already come in just in the last few weeks from 67 jurisdictions across this state. You can say, they say in marketing lexicon, uh, they've oversubscribed uh, the uh, total amount that's been allocated, which is a wonderful problem to have, a challenge nonetheless. Now we're trying to be even more resourceful to see if we can find more resources uh, in addition to the 600 million. These units must be acquired by the end of the year, so there's a date with, as we say, destiny meaning this is not one of those open-ended things where you hear of an initiative, it never gets done, uh, it's withered away, and the money is diluted. Uh, this is a different approach, focused, precise, 
measurable, real transparency, more important, accountability at the local level to acquire these units by the end of the calendar year. The good news uh, is the applications have come in and the per unit cost is actually below the state's estimate. And for landlords, don't get any ideas there uh, in terms of your negotiating uh, capacity. We're still going to negotiate down because of the bulk strategy here, uh, this per unit cost. Uh, but the good news is these dollars are being stretched further than we had uh, anticipated. So I just wanted to highlight uh, all of that because it's incredibly important to me personally. Uh, professionally uh, in terms of my roles and responsibility here as your governor uh, and one of the really remarkable things that came out uh, of all of the stress and the travails of COVID-19 with an innovative mindset on this issue and that's manifest in this home key strategy and manifest in the new approach uh, to again housing uh, as an element of housing as the building block housing as our foundational principle first uh, in order then to build the building blocks of self-sufficiency, which is ultimately what we are advancing. Uh, this is not a permanent mindset. We want people to move through these building blocks of opportunity onto self-sufficiency, uh, but they need that stability. And Home Key, uh, we believe, will go a long way, one of many programs, but go a long way to providing that. Uh, with regard to moving, uh, forward and going a long way together. We have been on this journey over the last three plus weeks uh, battling these historic wildfires. I, yesterday was with the head of FEMA, head of um, many, many state agencies, the head of CAL FIRE, among others, that uh, toured uh, a number of other sites throughout Northern California that have been impacted directly uh, by these wildfires. Uh, we were out uh, what we refer to as the CZU complex uh, yesterday uh, and talking to residents, talking to local elected uh, and um, local leaders of every stripe about uh, their efforts uh, to uh, repopulate many of the areas that were directly impacted by these fires. Uh, the issues of how these fires uh, have impacted different parts of the state goes without saying self-evidently has impacted different parts of the state differently. Uh, we have currently now 14,900 firefighters uh, that are currently deployed on the lines. That's down a little bit because we've seen some impact. Uh, we've seen some progress as it relates to uh, oh, getting our hands on top of the spread of these fires. We're battling over 900 fires uh, across the state of California. Uh, that has grown by roughly 34 uh, just overnight. Now 1.5 million acres have been burned uh, since this pandemic. Uh, we've lost tragically eight individuals uh, and have had over 3,100 structures uh, destroyed. And by the way, um, the eight fatalities uh, and the number of structures that we've identified as destroyed, uh, that's, that's currently observed. And uh, there's no question uh, that uh, many more structures likely are add that list. And let's just pray uh, we don't see any new fatalities. Um, so it relates to some of the larger complexes, refer to them. Remember, these primarily were lightning complex fires, many different fires in a geographic area, many of them coming together uh, as one larger fire, the LNU uh, complex lake. Napa area in the state of California. Friday was 35% uh, contained, 371,000 acres. You can see today uh, real progress on containment, 76% contained. Uh, you can see in next slide, uh, the CZU fire, 26 uh, percent contained. That's where we were yesterday. Some of the most majestic forests anywhere in the world, old growth redwoods going back 1,400 years. Uh, there's been real progress on that CZU fire, 26% uh, containment, now uh, close to 50% containment at 46%. Uh, uh, the SCU fire, and this is the Santa Clara region, 35% containment. When I uh, last presented these slides on Friday and today, you see uh, containment now north of 70%, 72% containment. 
uh, additional fires that we have focused on. And as a note, uh, the August fire, uh, which is a larger grass fire, progress uh, there, a little stubborn uh, from Friday till today, but progress nonetheless, 20% uh, containment. And the sheep fire, uh, another one we had highlighted that had low containment last week, 30% uh, on Friday, uh, the sheep now over 70%. Contained. So these are some of the larger fires. The one remaining fire I wanted to highlight um, is a fire that may not be as large in scale and scope as the LNU or SCU, but is precious in terms of the impact on the resources. This is near some of the world's uh, most majestic uh, uh, sequoias, the Tulare County. Uh, stubborn, again, 0% containment uh, now. Uh, we are at 1%, uh, but nonetheless, 1% uh, is progress, uh, but you can see the number of acreage, 23,000 up to 42,000. Uh, we again are monitoring this one very, very closely. So that's it, uh, broad strokes update in terms of the wildfires in the state. Let me just update you quickly on the case numbers on COVID. Uh, in the last week, we've seen a reduction in the total number of cases, COVID-19 cases, 4,708 is our seven day average. Uh, the new numbers came in yesterday, 4,000. Uh, 255, and that's based upon over roughly 110,000 tests uh, that came in, um, over 110,000 tests, uh, some 4,255 uh, individuals uh, were tested positive. Uh, we always look at the 14-day positivity rate. Uh, you can see this positivity rate uh, now down to 5.1% in the state of California. Uh, interestingly, um, and I think importantly, the seven-day, this is the 14-day positivity at 5.1%. The seven-day positivity is at 4.4% in the state. So 4.4% positivity in the state of California over the last seven days, 5.1% over the last 14 days. You also can see the average number of daily tests is starting to go back up again. Um, the impacts of those fires, uh, as we make progress in the fires, we'll get those testing numbers uh, back up, now getting close to uh, an average of 110,000 over the last seven days. Uh, speaking of the last 14 days, uh, we've seen a reduction in hospitalizations and ICUs, tracking roughly equivalently, 23% decline in hospitalizations over the last two weeks, 23% decline in the total number of ICU uh, patients that we've admitted uh, into our system over the last 14 days. So progress, ICUs, progress, hospitalizations, uh, real progress uh, we are seeing in sort of stability with our positivity rate, both on the 14-day uh, and on that seven-day. You can see the seven-day average uh, down to 4,708 um, as we continue uh, to uh, get tests north of 100,000, averaging just shy of 110,000 tests. Uh, that's a good sign, but nonetheless, uh, it is a stubborn sign, all of these slides, stubborn in terms of the ongoing reality uh, and the importance with that reality to extend a reminder to each and every one of you of the power and potency uh, of the decisions you've made to date that have helped us uh, through this latest uh, increase in cases, and that's uh, wearing those masks, physically distancing, washing your hands, and minimizing mixing. And I know this has become rote to you, and every time you watch these uh, presentations, I repeat uh, this mantra over and over again, but let me do it in anticipation uh, of this weekend, this three-day weekend, uh, the importance of this message, the importance this weekend uh, of wearing the mask, uh, the importance this weekend of trying to avoid and minimize outside of your household uh, mixing uh, with different households and cohorts of individuals, strangers, even friends and extended family uh, that you haven't seen or been with. Uh, this is so foundational. We saw this a few months back. We started to see progress over extended period of time, and invariably people said, well, looks like we're out of the woods, looks like we've tamed uh, this transmission, uh, and we can go back, uh, even with modest modifications to the way things were, uh, that absolutely we must learn from that example. We must absolutely learn from that more recent historic example. And that's why it's more important than ever to be vigilant uh, as we work through the next few months, work through this flu season, what we call this twindemic, the COVID-19 
uh, now meeting flu season uh, and work through this uh, invariable second wave as we get to uh, closer uh, to these vaccines and the high quality therapeutics that ultimately uh, we will have. The question is, uh, what impact will you, what impact will we make in terms of mitigating the spread until then? That impact is demonstrable uh, by your example and by the potency and power of these simple four uh, tasks. So thank you again for uh, the time and your attention. Uh, and again, forgive us for being a little bit over the map uh, today on evictions and homelessness, but I think they're profoundly connected as they are equally profoundly important at this moment. Uh, progress. Uh, again, profound progress on these wildfires, uh, and I cannot express more my gratitude to all the CAL FIRE men and women and all the mutual aid uh, from across not only the state but all across the country that's uh, really done an extraordinary job uh, at this historic uh, moment with these historic wildfires in this state. With that, happy to ask any, or answer any questions. Adam Beam, Associated Press. Governor, the state legislature has finished its work for the year. Lawmakers failed to pass some high-profile bills on housing and police reform and other issues, and partly, in part, because legislative leaders said they ran out of time in a virus-shortened session. Would you call the legislature into a special session this fall to address some of these issues and, and other issues related to the pandemic's impact, including broadband access for distance learning? Yeah, if necessary, I'm open to that. Working with legislative leaders, we've had many discussions over the course of the last number of months. Uh, there were some procedural issues that you're referencing. There were some issues uh, that were rather curious where both houses passed legislation. We were looking forward uh, to seeing that legislation uh, land our proverbial desk uh, for signature. Uh, I'm always open to that, uh, but that's based upon uh, a specific criteria, specific agenda, uh, and necessity uh, as it relates to any uh, of those uh, ideas or any others that may, for procedural and or other reasons, fall in short because of COVID-19. Justin Gardner, SF Chronicle. Hi, thank you, Governor. Um, regarding the legislative session, several major housing bills failed, uh, including SB 1120 related to duplexes that Pro Tem Atkins sponsored. Do you, do you wish you had done more to increase urgency around these bills? Do you feel you could have done more in that sense? Well, we did a lot. We were highlighting them here in our news conferences. We were working very aggressively uh, with legislative leaders. In fact, that bill passed both houses. Uh, one specific example um, uh, of, of a bill that uh, a lot of people worked hard on. No one worked harder than the pro tem. Uh, our offices were hand in glove in terms of those housing bills and those packages. So um, unfortunately, uh, that was the case. That's what occurred. Uh, and so we are looking forward to uh, jump-starting uh, those conversations. We got 18 bills done last year. A number of housing bills did uh, make their way uh, to my desk. A number of uh, areas that uh, we continue to work on where we're committed to the cause. And I think both the legislative uh, leaders, both representing the Assembly and the Senate, are committed as well. And a lot of work has been done this year, uh, which will lay the foundation for us to move very, very quickly into the new session. But again, uh, uh, we are uh, working very, very closely uh, with uh, with Speaker Ak or Speaker Rendon and, and uh, Pro Tem Atkins, and very grateful, uh, particularly the Senate's leadership, uh, with those bills. And just unfortunate that a number of them are not making their way to uh, to to my signature. Brady McDonald, Orange County Register. Hey, Governor. I had uh, two questions related to theme parks. Uh, first, how do theme parks fit in to the new uh, four-tier plan? Do you envision theme parks reopening with, like, outdoor operations first and then indoor capped at 25 percent or 50 percent? And then second, you mentioned that on Friday you were meeting in an amusement park space. I was wondering how that went and if any progress was made. Yeah, we were making a lot of progress in that space. The reason we set it aside, we bracketed, and I appreciate you recognizing we made that uh, we noted that last week when we put out these new four-tiered guidelines is we still have work to do. Um, all I can leave you with is progress is being made. Uh, we're still working uh, on some details. And as soon as we are uh, at a point where we can socialize, make public, we will. Patrick McGreevy, LA Times. Hello, Governor. Uh, many residents say they're getting dozens of letters from the EDD 
regarding claims for unemployment benefits that they did not file in the names of people they do not know, and they're concerned that fraud may be involved. Have you been made aware of this issue? What's the EDD told you about what's going on? And to what extent are you concerned about fraud schemes that are targeting the state unemployment system during the pandemic? Yeah, we've talked about it on multiple occasions in the past. The answer is yes, we are concerned about fraud in this space. We talked, I think, a week or so ago, we talked about some specific instances. Uh, you've added uh, to an example, uh, one of legions of examples of people across the spectrum, not just at EDD, that try to take advantage uh, of taxpayers, take advantage uh, of others. Uh, and we are working with local authorities as well as state uh, agencies, working with federal authorities uh, across jurisdiction uh, to weed that out, to call that out. Uh, and I appreciate you highlighting that uh, as it is a top priority for all of us, again, at every jurisdiction, federal, state, and local. Alex Michelson, Fox 11. Hi, Governor. Thank you uh, for the question and no grenades coming today. Uh, the, the, the issue of homelessness, um, you, you talked about it, about some of the progress that you've made, and clearly there is some progress being made on that front. But there's also such a problem that remains, so many people still on the streets. And I'm wondering, now that you sort of have some time to think about this, what do you think is really working in terms of what you're doing? And perhaps what is not working in terms of what you're doing? And is there any thought also um, in terms of um, commercial real estate, which is now not being used as much because of people are working from home, maybe using some of that for housing? Yeah, I mean, the reality is the answer to that is yes, and uh, local government is, has the capacity now and the resources they have not had in the past and the flexibility that they haven't necessarily had in the past to be creative in that respect uh, and to look at modifying existing use, uh, to have the ability to move money uh, at the local level, regional level, uh, as well as the city level uh, to match uh, a sense of urgency that's needed to address this issue. Look, here's, here's my belief, a couple things. Uh, it took us decades to get to where we are. Um, I noted in my state of the state, and I'd encourage you to go back to my state of the state, uh, we are committed to uh, all of the things that we announced in that state of the state. Of course, none of us uh, saw uh, this pandemic um, coming uh, as it relates to the impact uh, that broader agenda and vision uh, has had as relate to the pandemic, meaning uh, we've been impacted in terms of the pace of some of the things that we promoted. Uh, but we are resolved nonetheless uh, to continue to advance uh, those specific proposals uh, and more broadly that agenda. And fundamentally, and this goes to your question, the fundamental agenda is from my humble perspective, what doesn't work is continuing to do what you've done. You have to do things differently. There are certainly programs that work. They deserve to be replicated. But there are programs that do not work, and we need to call them out. Uh, just because you have a program, uh, just because you have good intentions, doesn't mean you're producing real results. There has to be more accountability. More accountability of providers, more accountability of local government. More accountability for people to say, you know what? This is not someone else's problem. This is not another city's problem. It's not another county's problem. We're going to take responsibility. We have a role to play. That's our approach on housing as well. I just ask those 47 cities that we put on notice relating to meeting their housing element and their uh, goals as it relates to uh, constructing more uh, units. So our approach now, um, it's, you know, we, we've been in here. This is just the second year, um, our second legislative session. Um, our approach is more accountability, a lot more transparency. We're going to provide more resources, but we're going to expect better results. And the area where I think we can agree on that can produce demonstrable results is, again, focusing on assets, these permanent assets, the ability to convert hotels and motels and buildings uh, at lower costs and the time to actually converting them happening within months, not literally many, many years, I think can, can provide us uh, more resources than the state has ever seen and more capacity to see results. Because what you want at the end of the day, you want to see people moved off the streets. So many people think of homelessness. I think homelessness, uh, broadly, most people think about it as street population. That's one subset, chronic homeless. That chronic homeless issue uh, has exploded in this state over the last number of years. It's unacceptable. And we have 
to hit it head on. We have to do it ethically, morally, we have to do it compassionately, but we also have to do it with more accountability and more, um, more transparency. Um, and look, I'm a taxpayer just like the rest of you watching. It's not just about more and more money. We want to see more and more results. And so this project home key is about moving in that direction. This is a big, bold push. Trust me, in the past, it's been incremental. It's been a few million dollars here, a few million dollars there. Maybe you hit $10 million and everybody thinks this is a historic moment. We're talking about close to three quarters of a billion dollars. We're going to leverage more money than that 600 million overnight, just in a few months in this space. That's something we've never seen in the state's history. And so I, I, I think that could prove to be very, very instrumental in jumpstarting a completely new narrative as it relates to this issue. Uh, and if it doesn't, we'll own that and we'll come up with new strategies. It's one of many strategies, but maybe the most foundational. And it will anchor, from my perspective, the new approach uh, that we're advancing here in this state. And that new approach was, again, enunciated in that state of the state. Uh, and that includes across the spectrum additional strategies, particularly on the issue of mental health, on issues of conservatorships. Uh, on our proposal we reference called CalAIM. We're not walking away from CalAIM. We may have had to delay the $695 million investment in that proposal to integrate brain health uh, and integrate physical health and lead the nation in this reform, and that's foundational in any real strategy to address the homeless issue. Uh, but that proposal is still very much in play, and we are going to continue to advance it. And as the resources present themselves, I can assure you we will mark uh, that moment uh, where we, forgive the language, turn the page uh, on the politics, the status quo on this issue, uh, and move to a more enlightened uh, and more demonstrably successful direction uh, tackling this issue. Ryan Heap, KCRA 3. Hi, Governor. Uh, more specific question about those EDD fraud letters. Um, what is your understanding of how widespread this fraud may be? And also, what's your reaction to the call from some legislators for a swift emergency audit of EDD to better understand the scope of this fraud problem. Yeah, we've got a brand new team, five new people we just put into play, place at EDD just in the last few weeks. So five new people with fresh perspective, new capacity uh, to get in under the hood and figure this out in real time. I appreciate the legislative urgency. We work very closely with many legislative leaders in this space. Uh, we share the same goals. We share the same urgency. Uh, and one of the most important things we could do uh, was get a new team of people in there. And that's exactly what we've done to get under the hood and figure out how would spread this is. Again, you're focused on one part uh, of the EDD challenge. There are many challenges uh, that we also have to address in real time. Uh, and this specific example of fraud is not the only example of people trying to game and take advantage of the system. And then, of course, beyond all of that, the imperative that is our focus as well by September 10th, by September 10th, of getting that $300 incremental payment into people's hands, into their pockets, rather, uh, or into their checking and savings accounts. September 10th, getting that $300 drawn down, getting that system up and running, which is foundational. That's billions and billions and billions of dollars in the hands of people uh, that really need it. And that is equally a top priority of this administration. Final question, Angela Hart, Kaiser Health News. Hi, Governor. Um, I wanted to ask you an election question. Um, I wonder how much you think COVID-19 uh, is, is going to shape the national debate over health care in November um, at both the state and the national level. Um, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, especially because the state is making uh, lots of big health care plans, regardless of COVID-19 and leading the defense of the ACA. Um, so I guess I just wonder if you see that fitting into the discourse of the November election, and if so, how? Yeah, I, I, I'm, the politicians make lousy pundits, so forgive me. I, I may leave you wanting as it relates to my punditry on this. Um, the next 62 days, uh, uh, sadly, from my humble perspective, uh, may be about other things, uh, distractions, uh, little things that become big things that uh, are advanced in order to divide. Uh, 
so the issue of health care uh, foundationally uh, we'll continue to focus on and continue to lead on. And I appreciate you highlighting the defense of the Affordable Care Act, that this state is actually uh, taking that third leg of the stool that was vandalized by the Trump administration as it relates to the mandate. Uh, and we reconstituted that as a consequence. And you've seen this demonstrably as it relates to the impact of that decision uh, increasing uh, total number of people enrolled uh, in our exchange, but also lowering the costs or at least reducing the impact on health care cost growth, uh, which has been significant uh, in the last few years uh, because of great work Peter Lee and others have done uh, on our exchange. We want to build on that. We want to continue to advance our efforts to um, reform uh, the Medi-Cal system, and that's a big part of the CalAIM proposal that I just referenced a moment ago. We're going to continue to drill down on uh, runaway prescription drug costs, this California RX looking to potentially manufacture our own generics or at least partner with a manufacturer to create our own California generics in this state, use our marketing uh, muscle, our marketing power uh, to leverage uh, lower costs for individuals, uh, as well as continue to expand our coverage, including deepen subsidies to the middle class, uh, which are struggling, particularly at this moment through this pandemic. Uh, look, let me just end uh, on this. It is, you know, box A, or rather uh, door A, or door Z, in terms of the contrast between uh, these two candidates, in terms of your health care, your future, your family's health care, your family's future. We can quite literally go backwards, an administration that wants to get rid of, actively wants to get rid of health care for tens of millions of people with pre-existing conditions, or eliminate health care expansion by eliminating the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and its progress that's made in this country. And another that actually helped design it and helped build it uh, and wants to create a more competitive environment to drive down costs and ex increase expansion uh, through a public option and the like. Clearly, from my humble perspective, uh, one candidate uh, fits the needs of this state by creating a dynamic where we can uh, accelerate our health care reforms. Uh, and have a real partner uh, that can advance those reforms to lower cost and improve quality as well as expand access in real time. So uh, we are very, very eager. We are very hopeful. This is a bigger part of the discussion in the next 62 days, uh, but I'm not naive about how nature of presidential politics works. But I can assure you this, uh, whatever happens in November, California will continue to lead and we will be creative uh, and work with, uh, through, or around whatever obstacles come in our way. And so I want to thank everybody uh, for all the work that you've done uh, to help us get to this point where we can lay claim to that 4.4% positivity rate. Let's get this down into, you know, let's, let's knock this thing down even further. Uh, we still have work to do to get this transmission rate uh, down. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do in parts of the state, certain counties in the state that are struggling uh, more than other parts of the state. But again, do your part. Uh, we will collectively come out the other end uh, much more quickly and certainly with the kind of resiliency that all of us expect of this great state. Take care, everybody. Look forward to catching up in the next few days. For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus.